This is Natural Powerlifting Radio. Deadlifts, chicken nuggets, video games. This is Check My Total, a powerlifting podcast with Timothy Payne and Andrew Henson. All right, welcome to Check My Total episode something. I don't remember. <laughs> what episode are we on? Are we on uh, four? Five? Five, I, I think. Know. All right, we're on four or five, episode four or five, people. <laughs> I don't know what episode we're on. All right, so we have your lovely host, me, and, of course, the one and only Timothy Payne. Hello, hello. And then we got a special guest today. We have Bridget Atkinson. Say hello, Bridget. Hey, guys. All right. So, Bridget, let's see, you competed... Just got done with the meet, that Tar Heel meet, right? Is that the right one? Yes. That's, I, I, yeah, that sounds right. On. Okay, cool. So you just got done competing not too long ago. And let's see. So you you hit some uh, you you hit some pretty good numbers that day. Why don't? But first off, let's uh let's just open up with tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Um. I'm Bridget, 24 years old. Um, I've only been, this is like a technical second year of powerlifting. The last meet I've done before this meet was April of the 2017. Um, I don't typically train powerlifting all the time. I just do it for fun. And then I decided to kind of take it seriously this past, since January. Um, other than that, I coached volleyball kind of turned them into little power lifters of squatting benching and deadlifting <laughs> yeah. all the time i'll have a power lifting team maybe um other than that that's pretty much what i do work go to the gym and sleep that's my life oh nice man your volleyball team is going to be good it's gonna have a strong volleyball i'm hoping, I'm hoping. so is coaching your job or what do you do so I am actually an IT specialist. Um, I work in Valentine, but, but I coach as a side job. Uh, just keep me sane because uh, I've volleyball for 12 years, and this is my third year of coaching now. Oh, that's cool. Wait, so you're IT? Yes. Oh, that's cool. I'm a, I'm a computer science. Uh, that's, that's what my degree is in, or what I'm I about to get, get my degree in. Degree. But... I know a little bit about IT. I just know a little bit, not too much. So what what school are you going to school? Or No, I graduated like three years ago, four years ago. Three years ago. I graduated from college. I had to oh, think nice. about it. Nice. I just got done with my last undergrad final today. Isn't, I'm graduating. Isn't that the best feeling ever? Yeah, I'll graduate this Saturday. I'm done with college. I'm out of here. And that was probably the best feeling that I've ever had was graduating. <laughs> Actually, taking that last final probably just was like, finally, I'm out of here. And yep. then real life kicked in, and I was like, can I go back? <laughs> <laughs> That's the way you're going to feel next week, Andrew. Oh, dear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, once I start working, I'll be like, oh, man. Hmm. So how did you get into powerlifting? Um, my boyfriend, Kevin, um, he's a personal trainer, and he's really into powerlifting. He competed with me last year in April. Um, he's going to compete in July at Luray for that push-pull. Okay. So he's the one who actually got me into powerlifting, and then after that, it just went from there. He coached, he coached me for this past meet which um, really worked out for us. I was surprised of how well it worked out because we don't do so well working out together. Um, <laughs> but I did let him program me for um, this meet, and it did work out because I put up some good numbers. Oh, yeah. So I was pretty happy about that. Well, do you want to share what those numbers were? Yeah. So I had um, a 315 squat, a 135 bench, and then I got a 330 deadlift, 
because I really decided to YOLO on my third attempt <laughs> and went for something that I've never tried before. And I just went for it because I was just so happy I got my elite total. Nice. Yeah. That, that's a, wait, what, uh, what weight class? Um, I was in the 148 weight class. Okay. Yep, and she totaled 780. So she oh. she hit elite. Oh my goodness, those numbers. That that's your street cred right there. Those are respectable numbers. <laughs> so what was the Finally. third attempt that you tried to do on your deadlift? For some reason, I thought 350 was there. No, and I've never tried it. I pulled 340 in a gym, but I was weighing like 20 pounds heavier than what I competed at. Okay. And so I was just like, sure, let's throw 350 on the bar. I definitely can pull that. And it really didn't move that much. <laughs> what did you get off the floor? I got it off the floor. That was my actually only goal after I <laughs> realized that it was really stupid third attempt. Attempt, I was like, just get it off the floor. Don't get embarrassed that it does not move off the ground. So I did. I got it like probably almost to my knees, and then I just let go of it because I knew that I might have broke my back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I'm done for the day. No, no more lifting. That's what I'm saying. I think I would just scratch my third lift if I already hit elite. Like, eh, I'm good. Thought about it, I'm... but <laughs> apparently not. I'm... You remember what I did? I got up there. I hit hit a lead on my second one. And then on my third deadlift, I think I put like six hundred on there. And I think I just I think I would bent down and grabbed the bar. <laughs> then I I just like stood up and walked away. I didn't even really try and pull it. <sighs> yeah, I should definitely have scratched. What? Because once I hit a lead, all my uh, adrenaline and my mojo was gone <laughs> for for the day. That's probably what what happened to me i was just like just throw it on there put every single plate that you have in this building on that bar definitely gonna get it and that's definitely not what happened (laughs) those are really impressive numbers that's really cool thank you i only was scared about my squat that's the only lift that I actually like out of all i probably the only power lifter who likes squatting so um, that was the only one that I was actually scared of that I wasn't going to do well in because I did actually drop 20 pounds for this weight class and, and I was kind of scared about how well it was going to end up being. What kind of uh, timetable did you have losing weight? Um, 14, I think I started maybe 14 weeks out. I decided to start clearing up my diet mm-hmm. and then... Somehow it just worked out. I don't know how because I'm pretty sure last year on this weight cut and it was only six pounds, it was a lot harder than this year. Um, but I started further out than I did last year and I cleaned it up and I was probably around four pounds for my weight class four weeks out. So I kind of relaxed. I still kept carbs in during the last four weeks and then... I think the Monday of the week of the meet, I was already at weight, so I was really happy about that, that I didn't have to do an extreme water cut oh, yeah. for that last week, because those things are not fun. No, they're not. That, that, that's a lot of weight to lose, 20, 20 pounds in that short time. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that's I was surprised. I didn't think it was going to work out. I thought I was going to have to go through an intense water cut of like hot baths, chugging water that whole week and being miserable that whole week but it just worked out I was really surprised I was kind of really happy and my strength stayed there especially with my squat during the whole um, weight loss and so I was very impressed with that because the only time I've hit 315 was when I weighed almost 165 and um, that was my only kind of one of my only goals other than hitting an elite total going into this meet was hitting that 315 squat again at a much lower weight yeah that's extremely impressive so like you said you cleaned up your diet like what what exactly did you do like or kind of like you just clean up the junk food and sodas and stuff yeah so like i'm probably was like the typical person of eating everything that i saw and i 
decided to cut out soda because at my work you get free soda all the time. So Ooh. I had to cut that out. Um, I went to eating tons more protein than I typically do. Um, and then try to cut out the carbs. I still ate Chick-fil-A all the time, but try to make <laughs> it healthy Chick-fil-A. So I keep myself sane. But other than that, it was just cleaning up all the extra stuff that I did not need. I started drinking a lot more water, too. Um, yeah. The one thing about when I work, I tend to not drink enough water. And I was drinking almost a gallon every single day or more. So that's probably oh, wow. one thing that really helped was drinking that water. Oh, yeah, definitely. I got to get better at that. Like yeah. doing doing school and college and like being busy a lot it's just like yeah you just you just don't drink enough water like you just, yeah i just don't did think not about it. realize it until i had to start drinking the gallons and i was carrying around the gallon jugs at work and people were looking at me like i was crazy carrying around the gallon jug but it worked out you yeah. did what you had to do that's right i, oh. I did I just don't know how I feel about carrying around a gallon. Like, I feel like if I walked around campus with a gallon, I feel people just think I'm some weird bodybuilder. It's okay to walk around with your Starbucks cup and your little Yeti mug cooler thingy. Mm -hmm. Like, walking around with a gallon of water, you look like a weirdo. Yeah. I got a couple of weird looks trying to fill them up at the water dispensers, and people are standing there waiting <laughs> as I'm trying to fill up my jug. I was like, sorry, guys. <laughs> All right. So, well, um, so as far as the meat goes, did it like it was? Did it go just as you expected, or better? Or like, did you have any? Like, did you learn learn anything about yourself through doing the competition that you can improve on for next time, or anything like that? Um, definitely one thing that I learned from this meet going into the that I'm going to use to go into nationals. I decided. Because I was going to do the push-pull in July, but I decided to take um, time off to really start building more strength before nationals. Um, the one thing that, that I did learn in this meet was sticking to my program because I, I didn't have any choice because it was my boyfriend who programmed me and he was there every day. Right. So I didn't have – and he knew what my program was, so I really didn't have any other choice than to stick to my program. Um, that's one key thing that I think helped me a lot. Um, last year I stuck with my program, but then I kind of, towards the end, I started doing my own thing. The, the complete opposite of what you're supposed to do as you're going through your peaking phase is not follow a program. And so that's the one thing I think that really helped me. And the fact that my coach was somebody who was close with me, who could see what I was going through, who could change my program if needed, um, just be um, from how I was feeling that day or that week. If I was maybe low on carbs that week and I didn't feel too good, um, he would change my program around to make sure that I never messed a rep. Um, and that was actually Kevin, my boyfriend's big goal during uh, my prep was to make sure I never messed a rep in prep. So then I didn't know what messing a rep feels like going into the meet. And so yeah. I think that's, one thing that really helped me because it was a big confidence booster knowing that I wasn't messing reps. I was hitting PRs that I never hit before PR reps. Um, I was like repping out 285 on squats, something I've never done before. So I was just getting a big confidence booster during this prep, knowing that it was actually working out for me, that it felt good. Everything was looking good the whole time. Um, my deadlift was the only thing that wasn't feeling good for me the whole time um after i think april's meet last year i did not do anything powerlifting wise for a very long time i'm pretty sure i turned into a part crossfitter for like a month hmm. and i decided to be a bodybuilder then i decided to do my own thing for a little while um that's that's one thing that hurt me so one thing i definitely learned is i need to maybe stay on a program during the off season or stick with something with powerlifting in the off season because my deadlift really didn't get any better right. yeah so uh, um that's my one goal during this off season before my for national is to 
really stick to this program that he still has me on to build strength and really deadlift. I got a lot of, I got tired during deadlifts during my prep because um, I wasn't used to going over 300 pounds for reps. And so I think that's the one thing that I definitely um, am going to learn from from this past prep and going into nationals is um, preparing myself a lot better for that. Um, yeah, that... Um, uh, go ahead. That, you having a, a long off-season before nationals, I think it was... It, it can benefit you a lot by having a longer off season. Like it gives you plenty of time to focus on what you what you need to focus on, and plenty of time to build on weaknesses. And yeah, that's what Kevin wants me to do during this off season. Definitely focus on my weaknesses, focus on building the strength because he wants me to come to the platform in October and November, whenever it is, with higher numbers than I've already put up. Yeah. And like, I'm pretty sure I said this in the last podcast, but man, this this business of like competing every every six weeks or every eight weeks, man, that stuff's for the birds. <laughs> like, that's not how you get stronger. Well, you're not training long enough to peak. You're like in a constant peaking phase, but you're not really in any phase because yeah. there's no build up to it. You need you need at least twelve weeks before hitting a competition. Yeah, yeah. Plus, also right. having that's- that. Exactly what Kevin said. Yep, and plus your programming—that that's actually really nice to have like a coach that actually knows you, and like mm-hmm. that way you're not just given a program and it's like you're going to do this percentage for this many reps and this for like the next three weeks. And like if you go into the gym and like you just feel like you have to hit those weights because they're on that sheet of paper, when in reality that's just that's just not how it is. Like you have weeks where you just feel like garbage. In days where it's yeah. just like this is, this is not good, and like having having someone that knows that and that can change change your program for the day, change your routine up to kind of fit how you feel, that that's really key. And plus that it's somebody that you trust and that has your best interest in mind too. It's not just some random trainer. Yeah, I think that's another thing that worked out with me last year when I went through the prep. Um, it was a power lifter who's competed. She's a, she's a great power lifter. She's very strong for her weight class and stuff. And I think the main thing was I had a big disconnect with her. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't really trust it as much. I felt like it was a cookie cutter um, program. And I was like, yeah, this works out for me for my first meet. But I wanted to make a difference. And I was glad that my boyfriend wanted to um, make my program for me this meet because he was going to last year and I didn't let him because all we do is fight when we work out together. And so I didn't want that to happen this prep, right. but it worked out. It actually was great. He was very happy about what I brought to the table and how things went. Even though maybe we had some training sessions where I yelled at him for him yelling at me about my bench and stuff. Cause right. I, my bench is terrible. Um, and that's his lift. Benching is his thing. And so is dead lift. So all he does, is, he critiques all my lifts and I just, get mad because all he does is critique me but it's okay he just has my best interest oh yeah just trying to make you better so how far out did you know that you could hit elite numbers uh, um actually when i competed in april of 2017 i was only i believe 60 or 50 pounds away from elite total from the so one, I, 165 number or the 148 number? 148. I competed in 148 in 2017. I know oh, Bradley said okay. I competed in 165. Yeah. And I was like, I know I competed in 165. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got you now. <laughs> yeah. So I, when I competed 148 in April last year, I was, I think maybe 50, 60 pounds away from the elite total. So I knew it was a very doable number. Um, That was my my, my main goal going into this meet was I was going to do whatever it took to get elite totals. And so uh, me and Kevin, we game planned. If I was having a really bad day, what I had to do. If I was having a mediocre day, what I had to do. And if I was having a really good day, what I have to do to get the total, and then what I can do afterwards. So we really came in there playing what would 
workout. I knew my squat was going to give really put me into that elite total um, and make up my bench not being as great. Um, so I was happy that the squats really worked out for me to really push me in to that as well. Um, three for three on squat that really boosted my confidence. And then um, on bench, I think we said I just had to hit maybe a 135 if I was having a bad bench day or a 140 if it was a mediocre day. Um, Unfortunately, I got caught on my 40 bench for my butt coming off the bench. But um, at least I hit my 135, which was what I needed as minimum for the bench. And then my deadlift, we are just going to see from what I had left. So your 315 on your squat, did you need that number? Was that your third attempt? Um, regardless, I said 315 was going to be my third attempt um, no matter what. I stuck to that number um, just because I knew it was a safe number that I could hit because I didn't want to go hit try to hit a PR and not get the lift and really put me behind getting that elite total that I really wanted. So I decided to keep my third attempt squat pretty safe even though I'm – might have been able to go maybe five pounds heavier. Okay. What you do? You remember what you did for your second attempt? Um, second attempt squat was three hundred. Okay. So if you missed your third attempt, you would have had to make up fifteen pounds somewhere. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, we try to keep my squat. The fifteen pounds wasn't going to be as bad, but it might have hurt me. Um, especially for my bench because all I got was 135. So right. I probably would have been pretty stuck on my deadlift. Like I didn't, I didn't want my deadlift to be the determining factor if I got elite total or not. Yeah. I wanted to feel comfortable pulling it, knowing that I'm going to get elite total pulling that, which I was very comfortable with 330. Um, but pulling um, maybe 340 or plus, I was not really that comfortable with trying to get that elite total. So I was really happy that 3.30 ended up working out for me. Oh, yeah. Well, that all makes sense now. You're saying how you were nervous about your squat. Yeah. So you said that, you know, your coach, your boyfriend would change around your uh, program based on how you felt that day. So, like, if you had a really really bad day in the gym or you felt really bad, you didn't eat enough food or whatever the case was, like, what, what did you change up? Like, what, what exactly happened during those days? Um, for, like, the bad days, I remember this one day that I was just having a bad deadlift day. He had me, in my head, was a lot of volume, but it just, it wasn't a lot of volume. I was just really tired that day. Um, it just wasn't clicking. I probably got off of, I just probably got off of work, so I had to go straight into heavy deadlifts right after working for eight hours and driving from Valentine all the way to Gastonia, which is very long drive um so if he would see that i was tired and we'll do one set from what's programmed he will tell me to back it down a couple pounds or back it down maybe a couple reps but usually it's more backing it down a couple of pounds so i'm still getting the reps that i it's needed um and he tried to be cautious from all my accessory work that he gave me as well um, if he saw that I was really tired or my back was hurting or something, he would pull out all the extra accessory work. He'll make sure to really roll uh, me out. We At Luray, there's like a weighted um, roller that we use, um, and he'll grab that and make sure he can roll me out. And I was feeling better by the end of um, the day, but he didn't want me too tired during that if I wasn't feeling good and he knew that I wasn't going to get it he wasn't going to push me to get it because his goal was that I wasn't missing reps during this prep so um he would change stuff around to make sure I wasn't going to mess reps but it was still going to be difficult and around the same percentages um that I was supposed to hit for that day so the weight on the bar would change Yes. Five or ten pounds. He'll, it would usually be the, yeah, five, ten pounds. It was never anything more than that. He was very cautious about that because he didn't want to do a big change where it may have uh, messed up maybe how it was going to go for that day and how it would be for the future. Um, and it usually ended up being on deadlift days where it didn't work out for me. 
Yeah, that's really smart. That's uh, that you change it up like that because that mm-hmm. not missing not missing any reps and hitting everything in training is just a huge confidence booster. And like you feel, you just feel really good, and you feel really ingrained to what you're doing. Like so, when you go to compete, you're like, well, I'm just going to hit all these these weights anyway because I haven't missed anything in a very very long time. And generally, if you're not missing reps, that means you're not killing yourself either. So. Right. That generally tends to help. So, yeah, that's, right. sounds like some very smart programming. And all the days, the days that went really well, or you that you felt really well, the technique was clicking, and you just felt really good. Did y'all kind of increase the weight, or you just stuck to what whatever he had programmed for that day, or did y'all change much when you were feeling really good? Um, if it felt really good, we actually just stuck to the program. We didn't want to increase more just in case that that increase would have caused me to miss a rep. So we usually just stuck to the program. Um, if it was feeling really, really good, he would make sure that my form and technique was really well for that, especially if I'm squatting, that I'm squatting um, two depth and I'm hitting it every single time. Um, if I'm benching, maybe if because I have an issue with my bench where I flare my arms out too early or my wrist or um, – tilted back a lot which he does not like for me Mm -hmm. um he'll have me changing little things to see maybe to make minor improvements um on my good days which i really liked that we didn't try to increase that weight because it was still that confidence booster for me usually on the good days it happened to be um the days that i was actually hitting rep prs especially with my squat and bench which uh really made me excited and wanting to finish out that workout really well yeah i think that that's really awesome because like i think some people when they're feeling great they really like to crank it up to 11 which you know that 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 can be good but it's like if you crank it up to 11 one day that means you might have a bad day the next day you might just be really worn out so i think i think if you're having a good day and like you said like you were focusing more on like really locking in the technique of all the reps that you were doing for that day when it was feeling really good. I think that's really smart. It's a good approach to have. Yeah, I hate to say it, but I guess Kevin might be a smart guy when it comes to programming me. <laughs> maybe I'll maybe I'll stick with this coach for a little while before I venture out. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you said earlier, trusting trusting your training is the biggest thing out of all of it. And a lot of people can't do that for 12 weeks or more. Like, that's, that's so true. If something ain't clicking in two or three weeks, everybody wants to jump ship and try something different. And right. like you mentioned, you can't do that. that that's, that's the truth, though, because you can even be on a training program or some routine that's that may not even be the best or the most optimal for the type of person you are, but man, if you believe a hundred percent that that thing is working and that you're going to make it work, then you're going to be in better shape than someone who's having doubts all the time. Exactly. And that's on, and that's on a program that's specially designed for them or whatever it is. Like if you believe in what you're doing, you're going to, you're going to do great. Like you're going to do a lot better than, some people out there as long as you're not training like ridiculously insane or stupid mm-hmm. yeah all right well i have to ask this question every time do you listen to music when you train i actually do listen to music when i train what do you gym out to <laughs> it actually depends on what i click on in spotify um if If I'm trying to really focus on, like, maybe a PR or something, I will actually put on um, maybe some Skrillex or something, some house music to really get... For some reason, that music just really pumps me up. Yeah. Um, And and so I just remember every time I was hitting a heavy squat um, PR, like when I did my 300 for a single during my prep, um, I kept putting on this song... It's called Pink Elephants. It's the Dumbo song, but there was a Skrillex remix for it, and I just went onto YouTube and played that song every time I had to hit a PR, a rep PR for squat. Yeah, oh. it's a weird song, but 
it it's the du- Pink Elephant Dumbo song or that Elephant's Dumbo song from the movie Dumbo, and right. I just played it every single time. Yep. Uh, um, other than that, it was usually just some rap music that I just clicked on, some Kendrick Lamar or something. I would just click on his radio station um, and just listen to the music. Sometimes I just blank the music out and I'm just focused on my reps. Other times I'm probably listening to the music way too much and not focusing on my reps. <laughs> um, it just happens. It does. <laughs> Uh, I don't even hear anything when I when I start doing my reps. <laughs> like, oh, my my hearing sense just goes to complete zero. Like you can be playing music, but if I'm in the middle of the rep, I don't hear nothing. Yeah, which I'm different. Like in the gym, it doesn't really matter what's going on, but definitely at the meet, I like having a song and getting into it. Yes, at the meet. That's all I did at the meet, but. The bad thing is at the Y, um, I get terrible signal at the Y, and so does Kevin. So we were having so many issues with music with my, my headphones before I was lifting. And so a lot of the times I was like jamming out on the corner and I was not listening to any music. I was just trying to pump myself up to no music other than <laughs> what that lifter was lifting to. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what it is about that place, because when we host meets and stuff, I don't really have signal in there either. Yeah, it's weird, because that's where um, Kevin trains at. He's a personal trainer there, and we just get terrible signals there, and it's pretty bad. (laughs) They're trying to keep everyone out. They're blocking out all the the agencies. Probably. So you said you you do volleyball. Or do you have any other hobbies besides lifting and volleyball? Um, no. I'm, I think I'm, I'm actually a pretty boring person. Um, <laughs> I just coach and lift. That's like my two passions. Um, ever since I got into powerlifting, um, I made that one of my passions. Well, now it's, I'm going to actually take it seriously this time. Right. Um, and then volleyball, obviously I've done it. I played for 12 years all the way from middle school and throughout college. And then this is my third year coaching, um, at South Point high school in Belmont. So those are the only two things I do. Other than really out cool. with friends. I like volleyball. I'm terrible at it. I'm complete garbage. Are you from the area? <laughs> like how exactly do you even start coaching at a high school? Um, I'm from Gastonia. I was not born here, but I was raised here. I went to high school and middle school here. Um, my athletic director that I work for right now was actually my PE coach in middle school. Gotcha. So it kind of worked out. I didn't know it whenever I applied that he was the um, athletic director, but it worked out. I They had an opening. I guess the current coach left or something. Um, and somebody told me about it and they knew that I wanted to get into high school coaching. Cause I, at the time I was coaching, um, club ball for mm-hmm. elementary kids. I wasn't into coaching elementary age kids. Um, so when I found out about the position, I applied for it and it just worked out and I've been coaching there for going on three years now. That's cool. That's all. Awesome. So you said it with your volleyball team that like, so I guess you, we, as a coach, like you take them to the weight room or you do most of their like workouts and stuff. So do you, I guess since you're like into powerlifting and things, so do you kind of just run them through something similar to what you do or do you kind of, do you tailor to them a little differently than you like, than you, you yourself train or kind of how do you, how do you train them as athletes, as high school athletes? Um, as high school athletes, um, especially in spring season, that's the only time I can really get them in the weight room. Since spring season isn't mandatory, a lot of girls actually don't show up. So, so I actually base my workouts about uh, who shows up or how many I have. Um, a lot of at the beginning of my spring season, I did focus on strength training. I try to keep cardio in with them. I'm doing um, ladder drills. Um, keeping the intensity up, they'll probably go do a couple body weight squats going into wall balls. Um, I did a lot of everything towards the end of the weight training that I did because we have stopped 
not completely stopped, but sort of stopped the weight training so they can get some on-court training with the two hours that I have with them um, mm-hmm. for two days a week. Um, I did get them actually underneath a barbell. They were, I had them squatting, bench pressing, and deadlifting, which um, I actually liked, and I wish I would have done a lot earlier during the spring season, and I'm going to do it next year earlier. Um, and my girls liked it, too, because they felt a lot – a big confidence booster being underneath of a barbell. Um, I was actually scared to have them squatting, deadlifting, and benching because of how young they are. Um, they're between the ages of 13 and 17. Um, so, and they've never touched a barbell before. So my biggest fear is somebody getting hurt when I'm in there and I'm their superior at the time. And so I didn't want them getting hurt. Um, but whenever I put them underneath the barbell, taught them how to squat, taught them how to bench and how to conventional deadlift, I was actually surprised of how well they picked it up and how like they wanted to put the weight on, but get it good form. And so um, during that spring season, I w- wish that I would have done more of the powerlifting background that I had, because I know they would get a lot stronger with that. Uh, but but I'm glad towards the end of the weight room sessions that I had with them that they did do that and they do feel confident. So at least I know when they go to, hopefully when they go to the gym during the summer, um, that they can do that stuff and not be scared in the gym. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great way to get them introduced. And like those compound movements will help a lot. Like It'll get them really strong. Yes. They can spike all the volleyballs. <laughs> hopefully, yes. That's my main goal is get them strong, get those verticals up, um, get them quick on their feet, and then um, it will correlate into spring, or not spring season, into um, regular season that starts in August for us. Cool. That, that's really cool. That's really neat that you do that. Well, you ready to play a game, Andrew? I suppose so. I think it's time for the game. Well, go. You want to explain it? Oh, yeah. On this podcast, we like to play a game called White Light and Red Light. So we'll give you a statement and you tell us White Light if you like it or Red Light if you do not like it. And then after you say White or Red Light, just tell us why you chose that decision. So, Uh, you ready? (laughs) Yes. Here we go. So White Light, Red Light, taking breaks between events. So, like... After you squat, and then we take like a 20-minute break, and then go into the bench press. White light or red light? Um, I want to say red light because, personally, I'm usually always in the first flight, and I don't like waiting between the other two flights for me to lift, plus the break for me to lift again. So I... I don't really like the breaks because I've already waited probably for 30 minutes to an hour for the other two flights before I can lift again. Yeah, Hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, that's, yeah, that does make sense. I I haven't thought about it from that perspective. Yeah, because, you know, you warm up and then cool down because you don't know there's a break. Then you have to warm up again. Oh, yeah. I get it. (laughs) Okay. You got one? Yeah, I got one. Okay, here we go. White light, red light, curling in the squat rack. Definitely a red light because <laughs> you shouldn't be curling in a squat rack. I don't squat on your curl or creature curl area. So that is my, actually, that's one of my biggest pet peeves is people doing that. But lately, I've been seeing people curling at the bench. Huh? I'd rather yes. that happen in the squat rack, though. Wait, do they take, Very like, true. dumbbells and they just sit on the bench and they curl? They curl with a barbell that's on the bench. Oh. Yeah, the straight and one. And stand over top of the... Um, Upright. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm I'm usually very disappointed. And it's usually happening when I'm about at the bench. <laughs> and so I have to wait for him to finish. <laughs> And your gym has a decent amount of, you know, power lifters or people that compete. So I'm surprised that people people haven't caught on to the don't uh, curl in the benching in the benches or curl in the squat. 
Me either. I just let them do their thing. I don't like judging people in the gym out yeah. loud, judging people in the gym. So I just let yeah. them do their thing and wait till they finish. <laughs> you got to keep it all in. Be like, wish this guy would get out of here. <laughs> in my head, that is exactly what I'm saying. It's just like, my goodness, like, what are you doing? Like, oh, go over there and curl. Yeah, I talk crap to Andrew about people that we see all the time in the gym. I probably shouldn't. Somebody's probably going to hear me one day and, like, chuck a dumbbell at me. <laughs> that's, that's actually one of my biggest fears. That's why I try not to say a lot whenever I'm in the gym. But some days it just comes out, and hopefully they don't hear me when I'm talking to Kevin <laughs> about it. <laughs> All right, white light or red light, guys that wear stringers while in the gym, which are like those super thin tank tops. Um, I want to say red light unless you actually have something to show off. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. Because there's a lot, lot of guys who do wear the stringers and they don't have the muscles to show off for that. They just wear it because they think it's gym attire or they see – the bodybuilders wearing it so they want to wear it um but if that's what you want to wear then you can wear it no <laughs> well, they can they can do what they want no okay. judgment this is i i like planet fitness no judgment zone <laughs> the no judgment zone where's the walk alarm yep <laughs> give, give me the walk alarm all right hit us with one more andrew all right here we go white light red light lifting after eating a big meal um definitely a red light i've done that multiple times and it hasn't worked out too well for me uh, because either it happens to be on a squat day or a deadlift day yes. and my belt doesn't fit or my belt's super tight and i can't breathe into it properly and it just does not work out or i feel like i'm just going to vomit from e eating so much food yeah i Luckily, I don't have that problem. I'm the type of guy that can eat 40 chicken nuggets and a cheeseburger <laughs> and put that belt on and go deadlift and squat. I'm not – I don't think I've ever – I have never puked in the gym from eating a big meal. I've puked in the gym before, but it's not from eating. Like, I've I don't know. I've never puked from the gym from that, but I'm not looking – I do not. I never want that to happen. No. So I'm what, just going to play it say? safe when I just eat a big meal. I won't lift. It's true. One of these days, I'm going to do the cheeseburger challenge, which is like, I think I'm going to do it either on squat or deadlift day. And it's like, I'm going to do a set of deadlifts and then eat a whole like McDouble and then do another set of deadlifts and just see how long I can make it before I puke. Like, I'm going to do that one. How day. many McDoubles do you have to eat? Just one after every set? Yeah, I think one after every set and just kind of see what happens. I mean, I feel like I could eat, I think I could probably get to about five or six McDoubles. Without yeah. puking. I think that'd be bad. I think that would be bad. I'm going to do it. Maybe I'll do it with chicken nuggets. Like, between think... between every set, you have to eat 10 chicken nuggets? Yeah, I think chicken nuggets would sit on you better than a hamburger. Which is exactly what I told you when you hit Elite that day. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh. All right. Well, thank you for joining us on the podcast. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was a lot of fun talking to you, getting to know you. Nice meeting you guys and talking to you guys. If I didn't really talk to you at the meet, I know I probably didn't. I yeah, it's, it's, it's like, hard to talk with people at the meet. You're kind of you're kind of focused on what you're trying to do. Uh huh. Yeah, or I'm like trying to find a place to nap in a corner or something. <laughs> yeah. Hey, which is important. People it don't is. know. Yes. You got to get your sleep in. All right, Bridget. Where where can people find you? Like, what do you want to plug any social medias, or do you even want people finding you? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, you let me figure out my Instagram handle. Um, my Instagram handle is actually at b s o n j a a underscore. Uncommon name ever. Nice. Um. Yeah. It is public, so anybody can follow me. I'm not private. It should be, but I don't have anything to hide. I think this has been a fun time. It has. 
Oh, oh Roy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's it for Check My Total Episode 4 or 5, whatever it is. <laughs> I still don't remember. All right, that's it for Check My Total. Do the cheeseburger challenge. Do the chicken nugget challenge. Reply back if you puke or not. But most importantly, check yourself before you wreck yourself. I'm out of here. We out. Bye, All right. guys. <laughs>